a young dad. Executed, ambushed, and executed. Motive? Hatred. Pure seething jealousy that he had moved on with his life, with a new wife and new children, and his ex-wife seething. But I don't get it. Her parents are multimillionaires. She lives off them. She has a new husband herself. Why all the anger, the bitterness, the resentment? Why, according to the state, did she order the assassination of her ex-husband, leaving four children without a dad? The state is seeking the death penalty on her. And when I say her, I'm referring to the ex-wife, 36-year-old Shanna Gardner, who right now is gnashing her teeth and switching her tail behind bars because she is the devil if these allegations are true. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here on Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. A lot happening in the case. First of all, listen to this. Jared, we shouldn't be here today. You should be making us laugh and spending time with your family. Your siblings miss you every day. There is a pain in our hearts that will never go away. Your parents miss you. Your wife misses you. Your children miss you. This investigation has uncovered the truth of Jared's murder. Henry Tennant did not act alone. Mario Fernandez did not plan alone. And Shanna Gardner's indictment acknowledges her central and key role in the cold, calculated, and premeditated murder of Jared Brightigan. Jared, we shouldn't be here today. Henry Tennant has admitted to being the person that shot and killed Jared Brightigan, but investigators knew all along that he didn't act alone. Once the death penalty was on the table, 61-year-old Henry Tennant pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and agreed to testify against those who participated in the crime, Mario Fernandez and his wife, Shanna Gardner Fernandez. Shanna Gardner, the ex of the murder victim who was ambushed at night on a one-way road. She arranged the placing of a giant tire in the middle of that very narrow road so Jared would have to get out and move it to get around. She knew he would be on that road because he had just dropped off their children after a visit. It was when he got out of the car with his little two-year-old girl strapped in a safety seat in the back seat. To move that tire, he was gunned down and left dead in the road with the little girl in the car calling out for daddy. We are bringing you the very latest in the case that has been titled the Microsoft Exec Murder. That's referring to the victim in this case, Jared Brightigan, 33 years old, shot dead, leaving behind his wife, Kristen, their daughters, Brexley in London, and boy-girl twins with the first wife now on facing trial for murder, those twins, Abby and Liam. Joining me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But first, I want to go to a renowned family lawyer, as they call it. There couldn't be a bigger euphemism than a family lawyer, because when you're in family court, fur is going to fly over divorce and custody. Kathleen Murphy, you can find her at ncdomesticlaw.com. You've seen a lot of cases, and many of them actually deal with domestic violence You've got to yes, really hate your ex to put out a hit on him. You know, some people have absolutely no ability to compromise. I just finished a five-day trial in Wake County, Raleigh, and it was ridiculously insane at how this mother perceived this wonderful father and the evidence that was clogging the court system like what 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 are you talking about just don't tell me that much what was it about a woman came into court and said that the husband yelled at her in 2019 and as a result she built a case against him as a domestic violence abuser the evidence that was put forth showed that she 
was an instigator of domestic violence. Wait, did created, you say he yelled at her in 2019? Oh, my stars. I'd be hauled into court it. all the time if David took me to trial every time I yelled. I try to yell <laughs> not when the twins are around. In fact, I don't think I ever have. But um, yelling it's does happen. Indicative. Yelling happens. Whew, I'm glad I haven't landed in domestic court. Guys, what happened to Jared Brightigan and what's the latest in the case? Uh, joining me right now, Ray Caputo, investigative reporter and a professor at Bethune-Cookman University. Ray, take a listen to this. So Jared and Shanna had 50-50 custody of Liam and Abby. So every other week they were with the alternating parent. So when they were with their mom, Jared would pick them up every Wednesday that she had them, to take them out on what was referred to as date night. And then when they were at our home for the week, Shanna would come to our house and pick them up Wednesday nights for a date night. And it was every single week. Our youngest daughter, London, had started going to bed. You know, we were doing sleep training and she would go to bed you know, before 7 p.m. So I wasn't on date nights with Jared and the kids, but Bexley always went with him. She was always there. And so he had called me right after he dropped him and Abby off at their mom's house and just said we had a good date night. Um, Bexley said that they got ice cream and she was still eating it. Um, and then, you know, she said, okay, I love you. I'll see you soon. Um, and then time kept going and I started to feel uneasy. I kept looking at the clock thinking he should be home by now. He's always home by now. Something's not right. London is too young to know anything. Um, Bexley is older. She was there. She's been part of this since they decided to kill her father in front of her. Um, I have to keep it in simple terms terms, because she's only four. She knows that two bad guys have been put in jail. And this morning I was able to tell her that who she refers to as the mean mom um, is going to be in jail as well. A life was taken and countless lives are impacted by that. So I believe that the harshest punishment is justified here. You are hearing Kristen Brightigan, the widow of Jared Brightigan. The death penalty is on the table. Take a listen to our cut 30. The state of Florida does hereby give notice to the defendant that the state of Florida, Florida intends to seek the death penalty for the first degree murder charged in the indictment. First, the defendant was previously convicted of another capital felony or a felony involving the use or threat of violence to a person, subsection B. Subsection F, the capital felony was committed for pecuniary gain. Subsection I, the capital felony was a homicide and was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner without any pretense of moral or legal justification. To Ray Caputo, investigative reporter and professor, Ray, have you seen Shanna Gardner's mugshot? She is smirking. I can't wait for the jury to see this. Smirking. She's charged with murder and she's smirking. What's that? I'm not sure, Nancy. It's a, it's a pretty serious series of crimes that, that she's been charged with. And there's nothing you know funny about this. I don't know if she's smirking because she believes she didn't do it, but her, her ex-husband, the father of her two twin children, is still dead. Um, so there's absolutely, there's no, this is no joking matter. And, and Shanna is in a lot, a lot of trouble right now. Um, again, you said it, she could face the death penalty, which is the most serious uh, type of punishment you can have in Florida or anywhere for that matter. You know, Dr. Angela Arnold, I, I'm, I'm always amazed at what certain defendants will do. For instance... I tried one guy for murder, a shooting, a shooting murder, and he came into court in front of the jury, and guess what was carved into the back of his hair? Hitman number what? one. Oh, my goodness. And so every chance I got, I would walk past the defense counsel table and beyond it so the defendant would turn and look that way, and I'd stay there as long as I could so the defendant would be looking that way. So the jury could see the back of his head where he had hit man number mm -hmm. one shaved into his hair and he was on trial for murder. Um, 
Just an example with me, Dr. Angela Arnold, renowned psychiatrist, joining us out of the Atlanta jurisdiction. You can find her at AngelaArnoldMD.com. Dr. Angie, why the smirk in the mugshot? Well, Nancy, let's not forget, this woman has been described as a person who has grown up not only in a very wealthy home, but those wealthy parents are still taking care of her. So it's in my estimation, she has never suffered any consequences for anything she's ever done in her life. They've probably always bailed her out. So she cannot even comprehend the consequences of her actions because in all likelihood, she's never suffered a consequence. Now, so she just internally feels like at her core, somebody's going to get her out of this. And that's why the spark. So you believe because her parents were truly loaded, I mean rolling in money, and they still are, that she never faced consequences. You may be right. Take a listen to Our Cut well, 8 from CrimeOnline.com. The former personal trainer said Shanna Gardner Fernandez, whose family owns the multi-million dollar paper craft company called Stampin' Up, told him that she and Bridegan were separated for months when their sessions allegedly took an unprofessional turn. The instructor, who asked that his name be withheld to protect his privacy, said, quote, They weren't really speaking. They were living in opposite ends of the house. She said she had grown up Mormon and didn't want that anymore. Bridegan, on the other hand, remained a devout member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So you hear the heiress to a multi-million uh, dollar fortune claiming that she didn't start a sex relationship until after she and her husband were divorced. And there the lover is saying, well, they were actually still living together when we cranked it up. So what, if any, significance does that have? Is she lying to everybody else and herself too. Kathleen Murphy, you deal with this all the time as a domestic lawyer. What do, are, is she painting a picture she wants us to see? Who cares if she slept around on her husband? I don't care. I care about who killed her husband. I do too, Nancy. And when you go into domestic court, the standards are so different from the criminal standards. And you see so much of that criminal behavior and the criminal tendencies. And you worry for your client's safety every time. Just thinking through everything that's happened and how many lies this woman has told, we are talking about the so-called Microsoft exec murder trial. That exec is a father of four, a young father of four. He's 33, four children. And the night of the murder, Chris McDonough joining me, director of Cold Case Foundation, former homicide detective. That's what's important here. You can find him on YouTube on the interview room channel. Chris, <laughs> she's just given me so much motive. Of course, the state doesn't have to prove motive, but look at the hard facts of the case, Chris McDonough. He just leaves her house. He hasn't been out of her house dropping off the twins for five minutes when suddenly there's an obstruction in the road. Whoopsie, on his usual route home, he's got his baby girl in the back seat strapped in. He has to get out of the road to move that tire, and in that moment, he gets ambushed and shot dead. If that ain't a death penalty case, I don't know what is. Most definitely, and you know, the old saying, if I can't have you, no one can. Uh, I would expect to see, Nancy, as this continues to unfold, uh, we're gonna see quite a um, impressive digital footprint. I think that's gonna walk us right into this murder plot. Um, what do you mean by that, really please? Interesting. Well, I think, you know, that to your point, this tire in the road, th this is a this is a very methodical thought out situation, but not in relationship to the brightest minds in the room. Uh, to the doctor's point earlier about this um, suspect here, I don't see her as being the sharpest tool in the shed. And so she incorporated the boyfriend uh, to put these things into motion. So I would suspect they're going to use social media, phones, those types of devices that are going to draw us into the plot and the plan here. Yeah, well, from what I can understand, from what I'm hearing, Ray Caputo, the trigger man who actually pulled the trigger, the assassin, 
has rolled over on both uh, the ex-wife, Shannon Gardner, and her new boy toy. Oh, excuse me, husband. Go ahead. Yeah, Henry Tenen didn't take him long, but he, um, in March, he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder charges, um, and he's he's talking. Um, he, he's got a lawyer, and, and but he, he has been charged and pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. So, um, and Henry Tenen, again, was associated with Shanna Gardner's boyfriend because he was one of, I believe, his tenant. So they had a relationship, and, and you know, you could tie all these folks together. It's not too hard. Guys, in the last days, entering the case, defense attorney, a name you know well, Jose Baez. Baez represented taught mom Casey Anthony, who absolutely did murder her little girl, Kelly. And believe it or not, she was acquitted. He also represented Aaron Hernandez, Jose Baez, and court. Take a listen to our cut 29. All right, uh, we are here for arraignment um, in Shannon Gardner's case. We would ask for a plea of not guilty and the men's government this time. All right, would you like a formal reading of the indictment? No, Your Honor, we would waive that. Okay. Your Honor, speedy travel on April 13th, 2024. This morning, the state has filed and provided to counsel a notice of intent to seek the death penalty. There you hear Jose Baez speaking for his client in court, Shannon Gardner. Now, you can look at it two different ways. You can say, wow, those two clients were acquitted. Or you could say, uh oh, here comes Jose Baez. He represents all the guilty killers. Take a listen to our cut 33. Who is Jose Baez? In 2011, Jose Baez was an unknown lawyer when taught mom Casey Anthony hired him to be her defense attorney. The court case was followed by millions of Americans nationwide who were positive Casey Anthony would be judged guilty by a jury of her peers. Jose Baez's successful defense of Casey Anthony in a trial that lasted six weeks made him famous. Former NFL star Aaron Hernandez had already been convicted of one murder and was charged with two more when he reached out to Jose Baez. After six days of deliberations, a jury found Hernandez not guilty of first-degree murder and talk of appealing his previous conviction, this time with Baez as the counsel, was a hot topic on sports radio. To Chris McDonough, what does this mean that Baez has entered the trial? kind of reminds me of when Mark Garagos would enter a trial. Uh, remember, he represented Winona Ryder, became famous when she was charged with shoplifting, lost that case, she was convicted. That should have been a, um, a guilty plea to straight probation or first offender where she says, look, I screwed up. I did a stupid thing to all of you teens out there. Don't do this. You'll get caught and you'll worry about it forever even if you don't get caught. Rehab her image and bam. But no, they went to a trial. She was mocked and uh, ridiculed because of her performance during the trial. That should never have happened. Anyway, it did go to trial. Then there was uh, the uh, Scott Peterson case. Uh, that was also a guilty. But Garagos has the aura of being a winning defense lawyer. And he is a good lawyer. Look, he can't help it if his clients were guilty. But when you see Garagos walk into the courthouse, you go, uh-huh, that guy did it. Is Jose Baez running the same risk, Chris McDonough? You know, Nancy, you've worked uh, among the brightest of these guys around the world, including yourself in the courtroom. And I mean, you you've seen these guys, the charisma that they carry when they walk. I got to tell you, Garagos has charisma. I'll give the guy that much. And he is a good lawyer. He knows the law. Um, yeah. Charisma. And you know who else was like that? Johnny Cochran. I disagree with everything he ever said, but I learned a lot from him. Judges loved him. Jurors loved him. Witnesses love him. He just was that guy that walks in a room and everybody wants to go say hi and talk to him. He just had the it factor. Cochran. He, he really did. And that goes a long way with the jury. If the jury likes you, then they're more prone to listen to what you have to say. Um, I don't know if they liked me or hated me, but I believe the juries I struck 
thought I believed in the guilt of the defendant. And I think that goes a long way. When they believe, the jurors believe that you're devoted to the cause. It's not just a job to you. But charisma, yeah. So what does this mean for Shanna Gardner on trial soon for the murder of her husband? Oh, the father of four children. You know, as much, and and we've talked about this off cam, Chris McDonough, as much as I get irritated with David doing this or that, um, especially when he mispronounces words, that just pushes me over the edge. What did he say the other day? I think I wrote it down. I'll look it up. But I love him. And more than that, and he knows this, there's no secret, I love the twins. And what would it do to them not to have their father? Oh, it's just, it would be awful not to have your father or a father figure in your life. It changes everything. It certainly does. And when you take that power of that charisma, you take his his understanding of the law, and then you add the influences of social media and today's media platforms, you know, he's got um, he's got a really powerful tool set in front of him. And he's got I think we're going to see him try this case like he has the other ones uh, pretty successfully in the media. Uh, And I think we'll start seeing, you know, that the husband is irrelevant here. In fact, he could potentially be the bad guy. Oh, dear Lord in heaven. You know what? Wash your mouth out with soap or I'll come do it for you. (laughs) Have you lost your mind? The murder victim because no. the bag. Oh, hey, I remember what the word was. He said, what? it's just anecdotal. I said, it's what? Mm. He said, anecdotal. I said, are you trying to say anecdotal? Anecdotal? And so we fought about that for 30 minutes before I finally taped him and sent it to the twins. Okay. So, of course, they don't care. That said, <laughs> I don't want him dead. <laughs> Yet, anyway, I'm just trying to figure out also somehow Chris McDonough has found a way to suggest that the murder victim is going to be the bad guy in this scenario. Dr. Todd M. Barr joining us out of Ohio, board certified anatomic clinical forensic pathologist featured in Thin Places Essays from In Between by Jordan Kistner. Dr. Barr, let's just get a little reality check here. What happened to Jared Brightigan, shot multiple times, died in the dark, lying in the road with his little baby girl, probably the last sound he heard, screaming for daddy, strapped into the car. What did he suffer, doctor? It's just unimaginable. I cannot even imagine, um, you know, what that, what his, his child went through, first of all, and what he went through. Um, I I, I don't know how many times he was shot, but I I do believe it was multiple times, correct? Yes. So this poor man uh, laid there in a heap on the pavement, exsanguinating, bleeding out. Uh, I don't know where his wounds were, but um, let's hope maybe one of them went through his brain stem so that he could just go peacefully and quickly. Dr. Barr. See, I understand what you just said, and I agree. But you do know how callous it sounds to people not in our business when you say something like, gee, I hope he got shot in the brainstem. Let's just let that sink in for a moment. Now, Dr. Barr. I just think that he didn't suffer. Exactly. And you know what? You know what, Dr. Barr? I get it. And I agree with you. Can I tell you how many times, in fact, I don't like to think about it. I wish I hadn't even brought it up because now I'm making myself think about it. How many times I've wondered if my fiance, Keith, felt everything that happened to him. He was shot five times in the face, in the neck, in the back, in the head. And in my mind, I go, oh, okay, he didn't feel, he didn't feel that. He was just like that. He was gone. But that's not true because I know he was still physically alive. His body was alive when he got to the hospital and he was killed in a remote yeah. area. So it matters. It does matter. So he, was, he was feeling, he could feel all the way to the hospital. 
Nancy? Yes, jump in, you, please. You, you know, right? We're all thinking rationally here, but can you imagine, though, what Shannon was thinking that moment? What? Did uh, you just call her by her first name? You're on a first name basis well, now? What? You're going to invite yeah, her over to dinner you know, between with you and your wife, Honey, and Shannon yeah. Gardner after the trial? <laughs> You know, Karen corrects me on my words all the time as well. So I have a lot of empathy for, for David, uh, 100% here. But revenge is such a powerful emotion. It, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Cause, so can you imagine that moment? I mean, we're thinking about normal people going, holy cow, you know, I hope that man doesn't suffer. But on the other side of the coin, they're taking selfies. Nancy, can Kathleen Murphy jump in here for just a minute? Because... I have to say this, I see a lot of this mental health behavior. I, I get a lot of vibes of borderline personality disorder from Gardner. She's, um, Are you she's a shrink? May I ask rage. you that? I, I feel like I am. I've been doing so it for then, 35 no. years. But see go the ahead. Behaviors. I see the behaviors and the fact that she has these frenetic efforts to avoid abandonment by Jerry, the litigation the robocalling, the behaviors that she exhibits are so typical in these high conflict cases. And when you look at the domestic violence in their case, it is outrageous. And finally, Nancy, you need to know this happened in my hometown. My sister lives seven blocks away from where this happened. Take a listen to Jared Bridegan's widow, Kristen Bridegan. It was very combative over a slew of things. You know, one week it's this, the next month it's something else. Um, she took us to court often, um, as the record will show. And one thing that just continually surprised us and our attorney was the language that was used in the motions filed. It was not professional. It had outrageous claims such as the father doesn't care if his child lives or dies, which is absolutely false. And things are just so skewed. It, it was just shocking that they would even put that type of language in something, especially when it was based on lies, absolutely nothing. You know, every time we were dragged back to court over the dumbest things, things that we had tried to work out via email or text, we asked ourselves the same question, like, why can't we have a good co-parenting relationship? Why can't we just focus on the kids being happy? And the tragedy of this, of this happening in my hometown resonates with me because like everybody wants their hometown to be safe. And this woman and her cohorts created such a local tragedy. They really did. And then Actually, she immediately left town and moved. Uh, take a listen to our cut 32 from Crime Online. Arrested in Washington State in August, Shanna Gardner was finally extradited back to Florida, where she faces charges in a murder-for-hire plot to kill her ex-husband. Gardner will be tried together with her current husband, Mario Fernandez Saldana. Both are accused of hiring a hitman to gun down Jared Bridegan, the Microsoft executive and ex-husband of Gardner. Bridegan was killed execution style in front of his small daughter after being lured out of his car with debris in the road on his way home. To Ray Caputo joining us, investigative reporter and professor at Bethune-Cookman University. Ray, she actually fought extradition? Extradition is very simple. All it is is are you Shanna Gardner? Are you that person? And if she refuses to answer, which she can, all you have to do is do a fingerprint comparison. I've taken that print right there in court and analyzed it myself and went, oh yeah, these match, that's her. And then you produce a governor's writ, which is basically an arrest warrant from another state. That's all you do. It's not about guilt or innocence. It's not about transport. It's not about anything except those two things. Are you Shanna Gardner, and is there a governor's writ warrant for you to be returned to the jurisdiction where the murder occurred? That's it. That's all. And she fought that, Ray? Did she fight that, Ray, Gar Ray Caputo? Yeah, well, Nancy, you got to understand that she, where she's from in Washington, it's kind of an insulated environment for her. She, you know, came from a wealthy family that has a, a well-known business. She, when she went back to Washington, she moved into a $1 million home. So, you know, I, I think that she probably feels that uh, coming back to Florida is, is detrimental to her. Uh, but yeah. that's beside the point, because the law says that, that you know, this is what's got to happen. So I understand why she's doing it, but it seems like it's kind of like a Hail Mary pass 
to, you know, just again to position herself to to try to to get through whatever's, you know, coming her way. Uh, would you consider that to be evidence of flight, Kathleen Murphy? As soon as the trigger man is arrested, she takes off across the country. Oh, it's evidence of so much. It's evidence of flight. It's evidence of disregard. It's evidence of her mental illness. It is evidence that her parents Whoa, what provide mental illness? and overprovide for Shanna her. Shanna Gardner doesn't have a mental illness? That we know of, but her behaviors are indicative to me that those behaviors are not normal, socially acceptable behaviors. Well, that's a far, far cry from a mental illness. Dr. Angie Arnold, you're the shrink. Jump in. Well, we don't want to we don't want to confuse a personality disorder with a mental illness. Okay. Okay. Well, you just did. What's a personality she, disorder? No, a personality disorder would be the borderline personality disorder. I okay? think you have a personality would, disorder. Me? Yeah. What do you, you mean? You always seem to think you know everything about psychiatry. <laughs> Well, let's hope I do, Nancy, or I wouldn't be on your show. You're so right. (laughs) But when we throw around the term crazy and mental illness, this woman is not suffering from a mental illness. She's a cold, calculated killer who orchestrated this plot, according to prosecutors, that is. Right. And you know what? Just because she works under a personality disorder, which I'm sure she does, okay, that does not make her mentally ill. What what kind of personality disorder if she had she one, has, and I'm not saying that she did, because I disagree. I think she's is, just the devil. What what, what has been, would it be? Well, it would be borderline personality disorder, which is an access to disorder. When we describe patients. Oh, dear Lord. Bingo, okay, diagnosis. like what disorder? Which disorder? Is she a narcissist? Is, a, is she histrionic? Actually, it's, it's in the same cluster, which is called a cluster B Oh, dear Lord in heaven, just give me an example. You just keep spouting out psychobabble. What is an example of a personality disorder that she might have? Borderline personality disorder is what she most likely has. What are you waving at me? It's already been described. Borderline is the what? That is a that is a personality disorder, Nancy. It's in the same cluster as narcissism and histrionic personality disorder. I just gave you those and, two answers. Can't you think of anything on your own? No, but sweetheart, what I'm telling you is borderline personality disorder is in that same cluster, so they all have a lot of things in common. In all likelihood, this woman does have borderline personality disorder. That's the personality disorder she has. Is that, that a mental illness? Mentally no, ma'am. That does Did not she know right and out. wrong at the time yes, of the incident? Does. That's really yes, all that matters. Does. Kathleen Murphy, question to you. Yes or no? Isn't it true that immediately upon the arrest of the trigger man, the defendant, the ex-wife, leaves the jurisdiction and hides out on the other side of the country? Yes, she did. And Kathleen, isn't it also true that the victim, Jared Brightigan, was gunned down within minutes after leaving her home on a previously scheduled drop-off of their twins, and she knew his route home. Isn't that true? That is true. Guys, how did it all go down? What happened? Listen to our cut to from Crime Online. Jared Bridegan had just dropped off his twins from a previous marriage with his ex and was taking a routine route home. Right after he dropped off the twins, he called his wife, Kirsten, told her they had a good day. A home security camera nearby picked up gunshots that rang out around the time Bridegan was murdered. His two-year-old daughter was in the car when her father was killed. Her mother, Kirsten, says her daughter will only say, boom, 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 and then she'll say, daddy on the ground. My parents were our home and I remember telling them like I I know something's wrong like something is not okay I kept calling and calling I texted and it's not like him to not pick up especially if he's in the car like he's not doing something else he's just driving he would answer his phone um started looking at traffic reports to see if there was an accident um, or anything and, and wasn't seeing anything so I got in the car I took my mom with me my dad stayed at home with London 
and started driving out to the beach where I knew he had been last. You know, he just dropped William and Abby off. That's the last point I knew he was. So I started driving that way. And while I was driving, I kept calling his phone. And after, you know, four or five tries, he picked up. Um, but it wasn't Jared. It was a police officer who just kept telling me to come to the station as I kept asking, is my husband okay? Is my husband okay? And he said, please come to the Jacksonville Beach Police Department. Um, your daughter's fine but he would not answer me about my husband. And that just confirmed to me, Jared was not okay. Um, my mom was trying to call me down. She said, maybe it's an accident. You know, we don't know what happened, but I knew, I knew in my gut that Jared wasn't okay. And, and when we got there, um, I saw Bexley and then it clicked. I'm like, if this was a car accident, Bexley would be taken to the hospital to get checked out. Like, this is not a car accident. Cause why is she here at the station? Um, and then it was a long night. Um, I had to wait a while until they confirmed that Jared had been killed. Um, talked to detectives. I had to call his family that night. So it was, you know, like my whole world just came crashing down. And I never been the same place. No arrest has been made, but a possible clue was caught on a nearby surveillance camera, a blue Ford F-150 pickup truck. The reward for information leading to an arrest of the murderer is now up to $25,000. And that Ford F-150 now linked back to the defendants. And now listen again to Dave Mack. Jared Bridegan was driving in his car with his two-year-old daughter when he came upon a tire in the road. Minutes later, he was dead. Drivers found the 33-year-old Bridegan shot to death next to his SUV, which was also struck by gunfire. His two-year-old daughter was inside. Investigators surprised she wasn't hit as well. Bridegan had his SUV's emergency flashers on, and a spare tire was in the road, which is why police believe his killer set him up. Police believe the tire was a lure to get Bridegan out of his vehicle. The shooter was only three to four feet away when Bridegan was shot. Nothing was stolen. Investigators believe Jared Bridegan was targeted. A reward has been increased to $8,000 for information leading to his arrest. He was targeted, all right. There's more. More evidence probative in this case linking the wife, the ex-wife, to the murder. Listen. Just 12 days after Jared Bridegan was gunned down in front of his two-year-old daughter, his widow received an email from his ex-wife asking for his death certificate. Now take a listen to Jared's widow, Kristen Bridegan. A lot of the time, she wouldn't even talk to us without her attorney. She'd have her say, talk to my attorney, email my attorney. Yet she reaches out to me personally, asks for a death certificate that I don't even have copies of yet. Like, I didn't have any at that point in time. She had already filed through her attorney two days prior um, on the, I think it was the 25th. I'll have to double check that date. Yeah, the 25th. She already filed a suggestion of death with family court. That was already done. So isn't it true, Kathleen Murphy, your veteran trial lawyer, that actions taken immediately following the crime can be heard by the jury, including you've got the wife planning her husband's funeral, and then you've got the defendant calling for a death certificate, and even worse, wait, listen to this. Eight minutes before sending an email message requesting the death certificate of Jared Bridegan, his ex-wife, Shanna Gardner-Fernandez, sent another email to Kirsten Bridegan. This email asked the grieving widow to return a set of school library books that were borrowed by the twins. Shanna wrote, quote, You can drop them off at any public library, and they will return them to Miss Stacy or return them to the school directly, unquote. Kirsten Bridegan said that after losing her husband in such a brutal way and only 12 days earlier, returning a couple of library books wasn't on her list of priorities at the time. Okay, I don't understand this. Kathleen Murphy, the woman is planning her husband's funeral and the ex, who is now the defendant in his murder, is demanding that she, the widow, return library books? Speechless speechless about that and it's just as more indication that her behaviors and her treatment of him all, during the divorce process post-divorce process continuing the litigation she just has no ability to have any compassion for this mother who has lost her husband it is very indicative 
of guilt, in my opinion. Speaking of uh, Jose Baez being in the case, here's another strange coincidence. You remember while little Kelly was missing, Top Mom goes out and gets a tattoo uh, that says in English, the sweet life. Uh, she was now free and living the good life. Well, a tattoo, uh, tattoo parlor comes into play in this case as well with another of Jose Baez's clients. Take a listen to our cut 10. The day after filing for divorce, Gardner Fernandez visited a tattoo parlor to get a special piercing and listed her trainer turned alleged paramour as her emergency contact, according to a waiver obtained by Fox News Digital. At the time, she and Bradigan were still living together. According to the tattoo parlor employee who didn't want to be named, during a dinner, she had, quote, been talking to us about her divorce, and she told us her life could just be better if he could just shut up and asked us if we knew anybody that could shut him up. I did not take it at the time as anything nefarious. In hindsight, I can see how that can be taken differently now. Good luck explaining that away, Jose Baez. The ex-wife now turned murder defendant is asking at a tattoo parlor, hey, you know anybody that could shut my husband up? Let's see how the jury takes that. We wait as justice unfolds. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.